So, according to my phone, it's 4.30, meaning I'd better get started. Don't want to let the German Pünktlichkeit down, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, thank you all for showing up. It's a rather small audience, but, um, well, that doesn't matter. I mean, it turns out that you people have a really good choice. I mean, thanks for showing up and uh, attending my talk. Today, I'm going to talk about something I'm developing called Cloud ABI. So, first of all, before I start, all of the work that I present in this talk is open source, even though I'm developing this for my, uh, for my company. So, I do provide professional support on this, but there's nothing that prevents you from using it. So, that's sort of the end of all the commercial uh, bingo that I want to share with you. On to the open source stuff. So, before I start explaining what Cloud ABI is and um, you're going to sort of all the messy details, let me first give a short introduction to who I am. So, for the last seven years now, actually, I've been a uh, developer at FreeBSD. So, about ten years ago, I started contributing my first bits to the operating system. The first thing I wrote was Xbox support for the original Microsoft Xbox One, which I wrote together with a guy from the like same university I went to. Um, later on, I started hacking on sort of larger projects and sort of the large actual chunk of kernel code that I wrote for the operating system was back in 2008 when I wrote a new TTY layer for the kernel that was SMP safe. Uh, the reason why I started working on this project was because at the time FreeBSD was making, doing a lot of work to improve SMP scalability and the problem with having a coarsely locked TTY layer back then was that every time a process would fork or terminate it would actually pick up a global lock. So forking and exiting, um, that really sort of didn't, didn't scale linearly, what you would sort of hope for. So um, after that, I started working on sort of more projects related to that other kernel, but also user space projects. A year later, I started working on a console driver called VT, which eventually ended up in the operating system and is, I think, in the upcoming version of FreeBSD, or this one, the default console driver. What's that? Okay, well, pretty awesome. Um, later on, I started working on Clang BSD. So back in 2010, um, some people at LVM started working on a new compiler front end for their compiler infrastructure called Clang. And back then, almost nobody was using it. Apple was sort of developing it internally, and they recently open sourced it. So I thought this is really nice, having a BSD licensed compiler infrastructure in a BSD licensed operating system. That would be a really good idea. So. Back in 2010, I started working on this, and eventually, uh, Clang became the default compiler in FreeBSD for most of the interesting architectures. So after that, I did uh, some other work. I, uh, in 2011, the new C specification came out, close to the end of the year. So uh, I immediately got my hands on like the latest draft I could find that wasn't uh, behind a paywall, and I started implementing some of the, the, the new features in the language, because I think that C11 is sort of a real good step forward compared to C99. Support for atomics, uh, threading support was finally part of the language, and at least basic support for Unicode. So all of those features I added those to FreeBSD, and the latest versions of FreeBSD should do proper C11. So between 2012 and 2013, I didn't do a lot of open source contributing. I did move over to, um, to, to Munich and um, had a really lovely time there, I had a really nice job there, but unfortunately it didn't allow me to work on a lot of open source software. Um, late 2014, I decided to quit that job and start my own company because, I'm, in my opinion, I sort of had a really nice idea in my head that I wanted to work on called Cloud ABI. So I started my own company to build infrastructure for secure um, cluster and cloud computing. It's actually really broad terms, uh, so the software I present in this talk it doesn't necessarily need to be used in cloud computing, but I think that for cloud computing, there are some really strong use cases. So, during this talk, I'm going to, uh, like, the talk that I'm going to present right now is sort of uh, chopped up in a couple of uh, separate parts. First, I'm going to explain what I think is wrong with Unix. People have different observations about what they think is wrong about Unix, but this is sort of what I think is wrong with Unix. So I've been using Unix for, uh, for a decade now, but in my opinion, there are a couple of fundamental flaws with the operating system that have never been fixed. So first of all, it doesn't stimulate you that you sort of run software in such a way that it's secure. And what I mean with that, I'll show that in the next couple of slides. 
And what it also doesn't stimulate you is that you write testable software. Over the last couple of years, we see this huge increase in writing software in such a way that it's easier to test. Testability is a really important aspect of modern software. Not only because it, I mean, allows us to write software that is sort of uh, more robust, it also allows us to write software that is more reusable. And last, I think that systems administration hasn't really improved over the last decade. So uh, when I started Unix, it was just maintaining a server and you know, hacking text files in ETC to get everything to work. The only difference we nowadays have is that we have some Go or Python tools around it that sort of attempt to make our life easier, but in my opinion, they don't do a really good job at that. And um, I'm going to, going to give a couple of sort of examples where Cloud ABI can be used to make systems administration easier, but those will be more towards the end of the talk. So, Unix security problem number one. In my opinion, there are two problems with Unix security, and this is the first problem. Um, when we start a process on Unix, it can do a lot more than it actually needs to do. So consider a simple web service. You're running a simple Apache or Nginx server that just serves a couple of web pages. In theory, this process would only need to do a handful of things. So first of all, it needs to pick up HTTP requests that come in on a TCP socket. Second of all, it needs to access some kind of data directory containing your documents that you want to serve over the web, so your HTML files, maybe your PHP files, or what have you. And then optional, you also need access to, uh, to a couple of database backends. Maybe you also need to have access to a log file, but if you sort of add it all up, it's just a really small number of things this web server needs access to. So if you look at sort of what happens in practice, is that a, um, um, if, if there's a security exploit in a web server, then a, an attacker can actually do a couple of things that you really don't want to happen. So first of all, it can just create a tarball of all world readable data under slash and send that back over a TCP socket to some kind of server on the other side of the world. If there is some kind of file system that happens to be mounted, say an NFS share or something that contains a lot of sensitive information of your company, then all of that data is suddenly exposed. And you could argue, well, then you should just set up your file system permissions correctly, but in my opinion, defense needs to be in depth. It shouldn't be the case that you're solely relying on a couple of permission bits in a file system to make your entire company secure. Even worse, an attacker can just register new cron jobs. You just invoke the cron tab executable and then add a, append a couple of lines to the cron tab of the web server's user. So even if you're patching up the web server to uh, sort of no longer be vulnerable, it's the case that the attacker can still, every night or so, spawn like a backdoor process that it installed uh, at the time the, the server was initially compromised. And even worse, it can also just invoke a couple of set UID command line tools like the write command line tool and can just spam messages to arbitrary terminals on the system. Even if it doesn't have any access to the, to the file systems, it can turn the system into a botnet node. It can just open new TCP sockets, perform SYN flood attacks on random servers on the internet, you know, um, create spam emails, all that kind of stuff. So. You just wanted to do these couple of things and in practice you're allowing the web server to all these random things that you don't want it to. So the second problem with security is running arbitrary third party applications. So in the, in the previous slide I was talking about programs that you can trust, sort of. <laughs> but um, now I'm going to, to talk about just random third party applications that you don't trust. Executing those safely on top of Unix is incredibly hard, apparently, because if you're just executing them directly, so you're SSHing into your server, you're running dot slash random process, then that could really mess up your system. If it's just running as your own user, for example, it can do a lot of nasty things. Even if it's running as user nobody, there's still a lot of evil things a process like that can do. So the last couple of years, you see a sort of the increase in the use of jails and Docker and Solaris zones namespace virtualization, and with those it's still quite unsafe actually. So every you know, couple of times a year they discover that there's still a new hole that needs to be plugged. A proc uh, a file system instance inside of Docker is actually exposing quite a lot of information that it shouldn't expose. So in my opinion, jails and Docker are not really that safe. Um, and then what you can do as a sort of a last resort is just run your process in a virtual machine. And that's also what you see quite a lot. So that people use Zen or um, KVM to just run a separate instance and run your processes in there. But the problem is that it increases maintenance overhead but also reduces performance quite significantly. 
So the, uh, question, the question I ask myself is, why can't Unix just safely run third-party executables directly? Dot slash whatever, and it should be safe. It should be the case that it can only access the things you grant, uh, that you grant to the process. It shouldn't be the case that it can just perform arbitrary tasks. So the other problem with uh, testing, I mentioned it previously, is reusability and testability. So programs on Unix are hard to test and reuse as a whole. And people often say, no, it's not that hard. Um, and, and they just give a couple of really simple examples where they show that it's, in fact, easy. But if you sort of look at programs generically, it's a really tough problem. And sort of what I'm going to do in the next couple of slides is sort of give a comparison about how we solve testing in a completely different area of, of, uh, of um, computing systems, namely how we solve testing in Java. And if we then sort of compare how we do testing in Java with how we do testing in Unix, you actually see that Unix is sort of really in the 1980s in that respect. So say I would write a simple Java program, namely a web server. Um, what you would typically do is, of course, this is class is far from complete. It only contains a couple of members and, in, and a constructor function. But you could write your web server like this. So inside of the class, there's a, a, a socket member you know, that sort of receives all the incoming connections and some root directory in the file system where files should be fetched from. So what you would typically, what you could write is inside of your constructor is, you know, when we construct such a web server, create a TCP socket and bind it on port 80, and the root directory is slash fire slash dot dot dot. So most people here would agree that this class is not really testable and also not really reusable because, for example, it can only listen on port 80. You can't run two web servers at the same time because they can only... Uh, um, they can't bind to the same uh, uh, port number twice. And it's also restricted to serving files from the single directory in the system. So what you would typically do if you're like a, a, a sane Java programmer, you would write something like this, where you sort of extend the constructor to at least take a port number and a root directory path name and set those in the constructor. And suddenly you can finally reuse your, your web server class. But most Java programmers out here know that this is still not the way you're supposed to write Java code. Because what you would typically do is use something called dependency injection, where instead of letting the class construct the objects on behalf of you, you construct the objects yourself and provide them to the class. So take a look at this um, class here, for example. Instead of having a TCP socket passed in, it takes an arbitrary socket. And the advantage of this is that you can create your own mock socket class and sort of inject requests into it and capture responses. So if you want to test this class, you can just simulate requests and responses without actually open a single operating system level network connection. And the same holds for, uh, for um, like the file system access. Instead of using like underlying system calls to access the file system directly, you could use an interface which you can call directory and it has a couple of member functions like get file contents, taking a path name, and then suddenly you can just um, let this web server run on top of a virtual file system. So like a, an in-memory file system or on top of a network file system. This is how you're supposed to write Java code. So the fun thing about Unix programs is that they're not written like the last example. They're really written like the first two examples that I showed. So it's either the case that parameters are hard-coded, hard -co uh, hard -coded, so they make certain assumptions, they are like, you know, I must open this file name on disk. And if they're not, not hard-coded, it's typically the case that the path of the configuration file that they use is hard-coded. Um, and um, even if they are like truly parameterized, so you can just pass on all of the configuration on the command line or override the place of the configuration file, it's still the case that these programs acquire the resources on behalf of you. You don't provide the network socket to the web server, you provide it the port number it should listen on, which is similar to the first couple of examples. So, this is a double standard, in my opinion. It's, we know what a badly written Java program is, but still, we, for, for some reason, we can't see that programs that sort of use the Unix mindset are also badly written in a certain way. So here's an example of a web server that is testable. So this is a, a program that will probably compile in any flavor of Unix, and this is testable, in my opinion. Instead of it constructing a network socket that you know, only binds to a specific port, you pass in a it always just uses file descriptor zero to call accept on. So standard in is a network socket that you can provide. 
And the advantage of this web service, it supports any address family. It supports IPv4, it supports IPv6, even Unix uh, domain sockets. And it supports TCP, uh, TCP, but also SCTP. So just look at the number of applications out there on Unix that had to be patched up to support IPv6, while most of them are written in such a fairly trivial way that they could just have the, the sockets injected. Also, if you want to support concurrency, you don't need to write a single line of code to actually get concurrency, because what you could just do is create the socket once, and then spawn 10 web, web server processes that use the same file descriptor. So it just comes for free, essentially. And this web server is also testable, because what you could do is you could just create a Unix socket and just programmatically inject requests into it and capture the responses. So there's no need to sort of guess a port number that might be free on the server and spawn a TCP socket on it and hope that nothing else on the network by the, accidentally connects to it or that you're accidentally running it on the same port as the production instance, all those kinds of flaws. That simply won't happen. You can just create a Unix socket and, and run this web server against it. So now that I've sort of explained what I think is wrong with Unix, namely that it's insecure and, and not testable, let me sort of sh show you like the solution that I've come up with to, to, to deal with this. So I've developed a sort of a new Unix runtime environment called Cloud ABI. And this Cloud ABI, think of it as, you know, Linux is typically capable of running Linux processes, FreeBSD is capable of running FreeBSD processes. This is like Cloud ABI operating system running Cloud ABI processes, except that Cloud ABI operating system does not exist. And I'll, I'll, I'll go into that in a bit more detail later on. But Cloud ABI is sort of a stripped down flavor of Unix that is, in my opinion, better protected against exploits. So the impact of a security exploit is a lot smaller. It's, it allows you to finally write software that is reusable and testable, and also sort of has a couple of tricks that make it a sort of a fun to use at a larger scale. So um, I'm not claiming that sort of the entire ID was uh, sort of, that I came up with the entire ID myself. There are some parts of, um, a framework called Capsicum that I reuse, which is a capabilities framework for FreeBSD. So, to sort of really briefly explain how Cloud, A Cloud ABI works and what sort of the, the intent behind it is, is I, I'm going to sort of explain what a, a simple process could do in Cloud ABI. So the most simple process that you can imagine, it starts up and it starts in the most simple way. It can still allocate memory, it can create pipes, it can create socket pairs, it can create shared memory, it can allocate, uh, sorry, it can spawn threads, sub-processes, it can get the time of day, it can do all sorts of things that only have a local impact. So you can't just open a random TCP connection to a server that's somewhere on the other side of the world. You can't just open a random file on disk, you can't just delete everything that's in slash etc. Um, you can't just send a kill signal to a random process on the system. It's really just sort of this local environment in, in, in which you can sort of compute stuff. Um, it's also worth uh, sort of me mentioning briefly that um, some of the sort of Unix interfaces are not easily compatible with this interface. So for example, the, the process table, um, you see that Unix processes traditionally do need to access the, the global process table and send random signals out to other processes. Um, so a couple of small extensions have been added to sort of safely create handles to processes, to sub-processes, so that you never need to inspect the entire global process table. You, it sort of remains local. So how can you actually let your process do something useful? Because, I mean, just computing stuff and not interacting with the network or with the file system is pretty useless. So file descriptors are used to just grant these additional rights. So if you want a process to access a file, you just start it up with a file descriptor to a file on disk, and suddenly it can just read from that file right to that file, depending on how it was open. Even more powerful, you can just give file descriptors to directories. So if you have a web server and you would just provide it a file descriptor to slash var slash whatever, then it can just access all of the files that are underneath. So it can't open dot dot or slash whatever, it can only access files that are strictly underneath the directory that you pass in. Um, you can also provide it uh, sockets and suddenly the, 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 the system or the process becomes networked and it can just uh, uh, you know, answer requests that come in. So what's really nice about sockets on Unix is that at least Unix sockets can be used to pass file descriptors along. 
So what you could just uh, do is give a process of file descriptor to another service that grants you more resources. So say you want to build a process that makes outgoing network connections. You can't just open those connections on your own. You have a separate process running alongside, so not a cloud ABI process, that can open these sockets for you and then send them back to your process through file descriptor passing. And it's really, this is really funny because then you can sort of make user space firewall processes. So as an extension to, uh, to what POSIX normally offers, these file descriptors are, um, they have a permission bit mask. So normally on Unix it's the case that file descriptors can only be open for reading, for writing, or for both. In Cloud ABI, every possible action that you can perform on a file descriptor is an additional write. So you can say, this file descriptor is open for reading, for MMAP, but you can also truncate it, and um, uh, you can, for example, um, uh, call F allocate on it to allocate more space on this. But anyway, it's really just an arbitrary set of bit masks where you can say, I want to allow these actions and I don't want to allow these. And this is actually what's called capability-based uh, security where all of the actions that your process can be formed is not determined by a set of access controls. It's determined by a set of capabilities that your process happens to have at one point in time. And new capabilities can be acquired, for example, through file descriptor passing, but a process can also discard some of its capabilities by just simply closing those file descriptors. So a secure web service, how would you model this on top of Cloud ABI? So it's actually sort of, you can almost literally take the description that I gave earlier and, you know, uh, for every sentence out there say, this needs to be a file descriptor. That's exactly how it works. Your process just has three file descriptors in this example, namely a socket for incoming HTTP requests, a read-only file descriptor of the directory containing the, 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 the HT documents, and an append-only file descriptor of a log file. So you can already see that if there's a security exploit in this web server, not a lot of evil things can happen. You know, the attacker can read more stuff from the file system, and it can append garbage to the log file, but it can't just throw away the log file or, you know, add new files to the web server root directory. So, the nice thing about this model is that it's also flexible at runtime. As I mentioned, the process can gain new writes and can also discard writes under the correct conditions. And what it can do is, um, it can apply the principle of defense in depth. So what you could, for example, do is um, say you want to build the, the next version of YouTube where people upload videos on, their, on, on your website and you serve them back to the user. You probably want to transcode these videos because the user just gives you, I don't know, some kind of weird file format that it used on its smartphone and now you need to convert it to sort of a sane format that uh, or even multiple formats that are supported by the devices that you want to support. So what you can do is, after you've received a video from the user, you could just fork the web server process and spawn a new sort of tiny container in a certain way that only has access to two pipes, to two file descriptors. Namely, one that's used to provide incoming video input and one that's um, uh, where you write the transcoded output to. And what's really nice is that if there's then a, like a security vulnerability in the um, video transcoding library that you're using, say a buffer overflow, the attacker can only write more gar garbage output to the output video stream, but it can't actually sort of uh, um, get more insight in how your network is set up internally or, uh, you know, interact with HTTP requests that come in from other users. So this, it's still annoying that the attacker can write garbage output, but still the, the impact of such a security vulnerability is really small when compared to uh, what's currently going on in Unix. And here's sort of a, an example of uh, something that's a bit more complex. Say you're, you're sort of interested in running a more traditional web server infrastructure. So where you have slash tilde username support. So you can go to my domain slash tilde add and it, it eventually serves the files that are in a subdirectory of my home directory. What you can do with this model is that you just run a separate process and only that process has access to slash home. And you can send an RPC to it saying like, hey, a web server request came in for tilde add slash index.html. And that process then says, okay, here, I'm going to give you a file descriptor to tilde add, and now you can access all those files underneath. So what happens is that um, um, an exploit in such a web server never would yield any write access to the system, but in addition to that, 
it's also never possible to access any files outside of the web directory. So it really allows you to like set, put sandboxes in sandboxes, and this is a like a really beautiful uh, um, feature, in my opinion. So testability of cloud ABI processes um, in a model where all outside or functionality towards the outside of the world is determined by file descriptors, it becomes really easy to test software. Because what you can just do is you can start up your executable with a different set of file descriptors. If you don't want a, um, a process to talk to the production database, you can just provide it a file descriptor to a fake dummy testing database server that only um, uh, returns data that's used for testing. Um, so it's incredibly easy to test, soft, um, to, uh, to test cloud ABI process. In fact, in my opinion, it's even impossible to write software that's not testable. So I briefly mentioned a couple of slides ago that there is no such thing as a cloud ABI operating system. Think of it as a de definition of what a cloud ABI operating system should look like, which system calls it should support. That's exactly what cloud ABI is. So it's an ABI definition that specifies the list of all the system calls, all of the data types, and all of the constants. So cloud ABI, for example, defines that eInval corresponds with value 18. It specifies that a, an offset in a file is 64 bits. All those kinds of things are encoded in the ABI. My idea is to add support for cloud ABI to other operating systems out there. So what this means is that you can just compile an application once. You can build software in your nice MacBook or Linux workstation. And you could, for example, run it on a server that runs you know, FreeBSD, Minix, whatever happens to support cloud ABI. So um, adding support for cloud ABI to existing operating systems is not that hard because um, I've already added support to a couple of operating systems out there, for example, FreeBSD. And adding support for this only required me to, to write 10,000 lines of code for the FreeBSD kernel. So it's really not a large investment. One person just needs to do this, and you can just run arbitrary cloud ABI processes on, on that operating system. So there are a couple of other operating systems that I'm uh, uh, supporting right now or working on supporting, namely NetBSD and Linux. Um, my, eventually, I just want to like, support all of the BSDs out there, and it would be nice if macOS was also supported, but I sort of need to tackle them one by one, of course. Uh, right now, I am focusing on only one hardware architecture, um, namely x86-64. I, I don't th think there's a need to sort of support 32-bit binaries nowadays. It, it wouldn't make a lot of sense. Um, I am actually interested in, in having ARM support eventually. You, you see that a lot of uh, interest is nowadays going into ARM. You can already see that with all those Raspberry Pi boards. Um, maybe I would support the 32-bit ARM boards, but I might actually skip those entirely and just go for 64-bit com uh, computing. So the nice thing about um, FreeBSD is that I managed to upstream Cloud ABI support into FreeBSD one and a half weeks ago. So um, if you happen to have a FreeBSD system that really runs the latest developer snapshots, you can run these two commands, namely this command you can run it to install a complete Cloud ABI toolchain, which involve, uh, includes a compiler, a linker, a standard C library, C++ library even, and then you can use that to compile C and C++ programs. Um, but it also includes a kernel module that you can load. And if you load this kernel module, then you can just execute Cloud ABI processes just like regular Unix processes. So for other operating systems, it's actually um, um, a bit more complicated because I don't have any packages yet and the operating system support hasn't been upstreamed. So if you're, for example, using Linux or NetBSD, then there are a couple of step steps that you need to take to, uh, to make Cloud ABI work. So first of all, you'd have to install Clang and binutils manually. Um, this is not that hard, fortunately. It's especially easy because all of the patches that I wrote for uh, uh, Clang and binutils have been upstreamed in the meantime. So you can really take, for example, Clang 3.7, which is coming out one of these days, and it includes Cloud ABI support out of the box. No patches required whatsoever. Um, this, the same holds for binutils. The upcoming version also has everything in, uh, upstreamed. After you have a, a, a properly working C, C++ toolchain, you actually need a couple of core libraries. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be able to compile the simplest Hello World application. So there's a C library called CloudLibc, which 
I wrote specifically for Cloud ABI, and think of it like this. It contains everything in POSIX, plus some of the small extensions provided by Capsicum, the capability-based security model that I'm using, minus all of the garbage that you wouldn't want in, in an environment like this. So if you're um, just building some kind of black box application that sort of is really confined from the environment around it, there's really no need to provide access to the password file or you know, provide functions like, uh, you know, could you kill this random arbitrary process? So a lot of this, these, these garbage APIs in POSIX that shouldn't be used, in my opinion, in a, in a correctly sandbox application, they're all gone. So it's a really lightweight C library. Um, after you've installed this C library, you, you, you could install a couple of other libraries like libc++ for the C++ support and uh, libunwind for exception support, which you like also want if you do C++ programming. And once you have all of these installed, you can compile proper Cloud ABI executables. And once that's done, the only thing you need to do is patch up your existing operating system kernel to actually run these Cloud ABI executables. So that involves going to the, the GitHub page, that I'll, I'll provide the link at the end of this talk, and uh, check out the proper patch set, and uh, then you should be all, all good to go. But eventually I'm looking for having at least packages for the tool chain upstream to most operating systems. So if you're sort of into the like packaging scene, if you uh, happen to be really good at writing Debian packages, for example, please talk to me after this presentation because it would be really awesome if we also had the tool chain upstream, uh, upstreamed in, into other operating systems. That would really lower the barrier of using this. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you how you can run a Cloud ABI process. And I'm going to demonstrate to you that even though sort of the idea behind Cloud ABI is sort of uh, perfect in theory, um, when I started working on this, I noticed that there was so, sort of still a missing piece of the puzzle, which I hope I've sort of resolved. So this, what you see here, is sort of a simple version of the LS utility that you'd normally have on Unix, but then specifically tailored for Cloud ABI. So this tool doesn't support any of the fancy command line flags, of course, but it, what, what it can do is it can just simply give you a dump of all the files that are in a directory. It doesn't even try to sort them alphabetically or anything, it just dumps them in the way they're sort of stored on disk. So what happens is that when this program starts up, it, it, it calls these two functions, it's actually sort of the most interesting piece uh, of the program, where it first opens the directory, so it can iterate through it and extract the directory entries but it also opens a file handle to your terminal, so it can actually write output to it. So this program uses the convention that's standard in. File descriptor zero is the directory that it uh, should traverse through, and file descriptor one corresponds with the terminal. So this simple LS utility, you can just compile it as follows, just install the, the, the cross-compiler toolchain, and then just invoke cc-o ls ls.c, like you would normally do on, on Unix. And then you can run the program by passing in slash EDC to standard in. This actually works. This gives you a directory listing. So even though it works, I noticed that it sort of feels unnatural. It's, in my opinion, not the way to go. So even though you can use your shell to pass in files to a program, or you can pass in directories, or pass in character devices on your system, the shell doesn't provide an easy and portable way of creating sockets. So if I would write this, uh, would run this web server that I demonstrated during the introduction, I wouldn't be able to start it up from the shell because I can't give it a socket. What's also really annoying is that the ordering of the file descriptors might actually be really important. So if your service becomes more complex and you need to start it up with uh, half a dozen or even more file descriptors, then you can easily invoke it in the wrong way. You would need some kind of documentation, uh, documentation that would explain file descriptor zero corresponds with the log file, file descriptor one corresponds with the web server root. That simply doesn't scale, in my opinion, and would just cause a lot of, system, uh, lot of headaches for systems administrators. Even worse, you can't actually deal with a variable number of file descriptors. Say you have a web server that can, uh, can listen on multiple sockets, could use multiple database backends, and like multiple of those at the same time, what would the numbering scheme look like? You would need to sort of somehow provide passing like command line variables saying like, uh, you know, the first file, five file descriptors correspond with database backends and then there's a, like a seven or so log files. That simply wouldn't work. I can't see that working. Um, what you also lose is sort of the, the transparency in Unix where you can write a single configuration file 
where you just explain how the entire server should work. You know, if you look at the Apache configuration file, there are a lot of configuration parameters that sort of um, have nothing to do with which resources to access. They only describe how the process should behave. But on the other end, you also list a lot of path names and uh, uh, network addresses that the process um, depends on. So I thought about it a bit, well, actually quite a lot, and I came up with the following solution. I wrote a utility called Cloud ABI Dash Run. And this utility is incredibly simple. I think it's only uh, 200 or 300 lines of code right now, and that's mainly because it, uh, it, it needs to do some file parsing in there. But how it works, you just invoke it with an executable, and on standard in, you provide it a configuration. And this process allows you to start an, ex an executable with an exact set of file descriptors. It makes sure that no file descriptors leak into the process, and it makes sure that none of them are missing. And what it does, it merges the concept of program configuration with providing access to external resources. So that means that you still have your traditional configuration file in which you have configuration parameters but also list the dependencies of the process. And how it does that, it replaces the traditional command line arguments by a YAML-like tree structure. So there is no more argv. When your process starts up, it has something else, namely a tree structure of configuration parameters, but also of resources it can iterate through. So, say you would write a very simple web server. So, this still has nothing to do with Cloud ABI, but you would just write a simple web server that takes a configuration file. You could, for example, use YAML. And in this configuration file, you would have a couple of configuration attributes, like the host name that is, uh, for example, return on all of the error messages and in the HTTP headers. You would want to specify the number of concurrent connections that this web server should receive, so in this case 64, and you would say it needs to listen on this IP address and port number. Then it, finally it also needs access to a couple of files on disk. So Cloud ABI Run accepts a configuration that looks a bit like this, but is annotated in a special way. What most people don't know is that YAML is actually a typed language. So um, there is a difference between the string 8 and the integer 8, and you can actually write it down in different ways to sort of uh, uh, remain type safe. So Cloud ABI uh, Run uses tags from a special YAML namespace, which you see here at the top, and it allows us to use these tags with exclamation marks, like exclamation mark socket, exclamation mark file, to add dependencies on resources that the program wants to use. So this is almost the same as the previous configuration file, but you see that all of the attributes that either refer to socket addresses, you know, binding on a certain address, or path names on disk, they've been extended to use these exclamation mark, uh, exclamation mark file and exclamation mark socket tags. And what Cloud ABI Run does is that it scans through this file, it parses the YAML file for you, and it tries to acquire these resources for you. So it calls socket and bind to obtain a socket that's bound to this IP address. It calls open to, um, to open these, these files, so this log file in this web directory. And it replaces this by FD tags, file descriptor tags, as references to those file descriptors. So when it created a socket and bound on it, it turned out it was file descriptor 17, 42, and 28 for the log file in the root directory. And this is what's being passed on to the application. Well, not yet, there is still one pass in between, namely a sanitizing pass. And what it does, it closes all of the other file descriptors that happened to be open at the time the Cloud ABI run was running, and also renumbers the file descriptors to be sequential. And the reason for this is that it makes the execution of the program a bit more deterministic. So every time you start up the process with the same configuration file, it's also the case that the numbers of the file descriptors match up. Otherwise, that would be a bit more annoying when debugging processes. So how does this look from a, from a, program, a programmer's point of view? Because eventually you need to access this, this data from your program. So instead of using the traditional int main, int argc, car argv function, you, now use a, you, you may optionally use an alternative entry point called program underscore main. And it only um, has a single argument, namely an arc data t. And this is a handle to this tree structure. You can just iterate over it. So because the configuration in our previous example was actually a, a, a mapping, you know, it's always a, a key value, it's sort of a, a dictionary, 
we see that this piece of code now invokes a function called arcDataIteratemap. And you pass in this handle to this node of the tree, namely the root, and you pass it a function that needs to be invoked for every element, so a callback function and also some argument data that needs to be passed. In. And now you can just, I mean, I tried sort of simplifying this code as much as possible. I removed all of the error handling, but this would be your configuration file parser. So you see that we first obtain the, the string value of the key. So in this case, we're trying to extract host name, concurrent connections, listen, log file, root there. And we perform a string comparison on those. So if it's a host name, then we can just ex extract a C string argument from this tree structure. So now we've obtained the host name. And we can call this function, getfd, to extract file descriptor numbers from the tree. So it's really important to keep in mind, integers and file descriptors are two separate types. Because Cloud ABI run needs to know which numbers are file descriptors and which ones aren't, because it needs to know which of those file descriptors need to be passed on to the new process. So this is actually a really nifty tool I've discovered, because it allows you to configure a service securely without any additional effort. If you compare this to SE Linux or AppArmor, where you have to write separate security policies and separate configuration files, something like this is completely not needed for Cloud ABI. You still have a single configuration file in which you configure the program and you start it up and it's secure. So if you change a path name in your configuration and start it up again, it should still work, unlike AppArmor. Also, it's impossible to invoke programs incorrectly, as in getting the ordering of the file descriptors wrong, because programs don't depend on the order ordering of the file descriptors. It's no longer the case that zero is standard in, one is standard out, and two is standard error. Programs start up and they just have a big bag of file descriptors that they have to use to, uh, to run correctly. And um, what's also really cool is YAML, it, loses, it, it uses uh, YAML 1.2, and YAML is also a, um, a superset of JSON. So you can use any tool that generates JSON or YAML and just pass that data to the program directly. And that's really nice. So there's no more invoking programs through the shell and making sure you get all the escaping right. You can use high-level libraries to actually construct the data you want to pass onto the program. So from a security point of view, this is awesome, in my opinion. Also, for software developers, there's no longer a need to write a configuration file parser because this all just comes for free. You just run Cloud ABI with the YAML file and your program receives it in a tree structure already in pre-parsed form. So um, it also means that programs no longer need to require any resources in startup. So as soon as your program starts running, you can already do the stuff that actually matters. Accept requests and just uh, process them instead of first spending like, you know, writing tens of thousands of lines of code maybe in a large application to just parse the configuration file or set up all the resources correctly. So the final thing I want to discuss is um, uh, what are the use cases for Cloud ABI? Uh, so a couple of these use cases that I present are either things that I sort of made up myself or where I think where Cloud ABI is, is um, a good tool, but it's also based on some feedback I got from companies that really showed an interest in using Cloud ABI for a couple of their, um, for, for their purposes. So even though Cloud ABI is cloud in the name, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can only use it for cloud and cluster computing. I've seen some interest from uh, hardware appliance vendors. So for example, companies developing storage solutions or firewalls, and they're actually thinking about using Cloud ABI to harden the processes running on their systems. So in addition to making their software a lot more secure, it makes it a lot easier for them to run third-party software. So um, in FreeBSD, there ex exists a technology called NetMap, and NetMap allows you to efficiently do firewalling in user space. So it's a sort of a lockless queue in which network packets are exposed to processes and the processes can apply filtering to them or uh, discard packets. And this would allow people to just write these third-party filtering libraries. And if there's a security exploit in it, then the, the appliance as a whole is not compromised. So it makes it easier for network firewall vendors to uh, sort of allow modification or extension of their functionality through third-party plugins. Also, I've, I've worked for a company that made a, um, a sort of a email spam filtering appliances, and I used a binary blob component to do the spam filtering. 
which is really bad because if there's a security exploit in that spam filter, there's nothing you can do yourself to, uh, to, to secure this. What if that um, uh, like virus scanner vendor supplied their um, virus scanner as a cloud ABI executable that would only, for example, take one pipe for the incoming email, one pipe for the outgoing email? Um, that would make it a lot more secure. So even if there are a couple of security exploits in the, um, in, in the virus scanner, it's still not that bad as it is right now. So another example I thought of is having Cloud ABI as a service. So right now people use Amazon EC2 or Google Cloud Computing, Google App Engine, but in my opinion, these services sort of don't um, tackle the problem as a whole. So Amazon EC2 makes it a lot easier to get your hands on computing resources, but it doesn't make life simpler for you. Because every Amazon EC2 instance you get is basically just a new computer for which you also need to do the systems administration. So we've tried to solve this by coming up with tools like Puppet to automatically administer all those systems, but the problem is it is in the root, in my opinion, you shouldn't be doing any whole system systems administrator if you have a cloud computing platform. It should be the case that you just have a program that you want to run, be it like a computationally intensive program or a web service. You just give them the binary and let them run it. And Cloud ABI makes that easier to do without using any virtualization. So right now, I think Amazon EC2 uses uh, Zen and Google Compute uses, I think, KVM. I'm not sure about that. These impose a lot of CPU overhead, but a technology like Cloud ABI could make it possible to run these systems directly on top of a Unix kernel without any CPU virtualization overhead. And what's also really nice is, uh, so Google App Engine is a really nice cloud computing uh, framework that I like. What you do is you just write a whole pile of Python code that you just want to run uh, in the cloud and you just throw it over the fence and Google just runs it for you. The only problem is that Google App Engine only supports a couple of scripted or interpreted programming languages because those are the ones that they can do sort of uh, analysis on to make sure that it won't escape the, like the confinement of the sandbox. But with something like Cloud ABI, you could just run arbitrary processes. You could say, I'm compiling a special Ruby interpreter for Cloud ABI and just running it with a couple of Ruby files that I, that I provide. So, finally, one of the use cases that I've been thinking of, what's also really interesting about Cloud ABI, is that you could use it as the basis of a cluster management suite. So, what you could do is you could just make this really tiny process that just runs on a, like a, on, on a whole pile of servers, and the only thing it does is it just accepts RPCs, instructions, you know, what should I run? Similar to systems like Kubernetes. But the nice thing about Cloud ABI is that because you have to provide all of the dependencies of a program explicitly, you have a really accurate, high-quality dependency graph of all the processes. And this allows you to, do, to sort of add so much more smartness to the system as what we currently see. So right now with Kubernetes processes start up and if one of the backends of a service is down, it just sits there, it runs, but it fails to connect to its backend. With something like Cloud ABI, the cluster management system would already know that this is happening, can just say, I'm not scheduling this process until all of its um, uh, dependencies are fulfilled. It could also make more high quality scheduling decisions like, I see that all of these database servers are running, running in one rack over here. I might as well just run a couple of front-end processes right next to them instead of running them on the other side of the data center, or maybe even worse, in a different continent. So this is a lot easier if you would sort of have a, a cluster management system purely built on, on technology like Cloud ABI. Also because all the dependencies are known, if you want to migrate a process from one server to the other, you know, you exactly know which files on disk it, it's going to um, access and you know uh, what to migrate over to the new server. So, these are sort of the, uh, like, this is sort of Cloud ABI in a nutshell. I, I hope I clearly explained sort of what the intent behind Cloud ABI is, how it sort of works, and what the use cases are. There is a, uh, a page on GitHub, the Cloud Libc repository, and it sort of has a nice introduction and some links to some other interesting articles. And of course, the source code itself, which you can sort of try it and experiment with. If you've, even if you're not interested in, in, in sort of using this in Cloud ABI, in my opinion, it's also a really high quality C library. So if you're interested in knowing how a certain C library function is actually implemented, be sure to check it out. And uh, there's also a whole pile of tests with it, so it's really good to also get some example code on how it works. There's also an uh, IRC channel on EFNet called Cloud ABI. Be sure to drop by and uh, 
lurk to see what's going on. And finally, my company, Nuxi, if you would be interested in commercial support on technology like this or could think of a killer use case, then be sure to, to contact us. That'll be it. Are there any questions? Wow. Maybe tomorrow, yeah. I'll be here tomorrow as well, so uh, if you sort of happen to stumble uh, into me tomorrow, then you know, just uh, chat with me a bit and uh, let me know what you think about it. You had a question. Yeah. Exactly. That's that's a really good remark. So. Exactly. That that's a really good remark. So. Uh, with Cloud ABI, a lot of people often sort of present these use cases like, it can't do this. But it's, of course, really important to um, realize that Cloud ABI is not meant to cover the 100%. Um, there are, of course, quite a lot of things that really need to be done in a traditional process where you do have access to all of these global namespaces. So what you could, for example, do is, um, I I've been thinking about this, is let every system run like a master process that can provide access to arbitrary directories, arbitrary sockets, you know, it can connect to everything in the internet, can bind to everything. Sort of the root process, what root could normally do, let that run in a process. And then you would just have these stacking like adapter processes on top of that that can do all sorts of interesting filtering and whitelisting. And that would at least make systems a lot more secure. So even for a cloud computing platform, you could make it completely safe, you could be completely sure that processes running on top of your cloud computing network don't connect to your internal network. Um, it, it sort of finally allows you to do uh, user space firewalling. Because what you see right now is that you have all these really complex firewall policies. The grammar of, 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 of like the, the, the features that a firewall in the kernel has are constantly growing because people come up with new criteria that needed to be filtered on. And something like this could finally allow you to, to do all of that in user space. Yeah. So this is really not meant to cover the 100% right now, at least. It's, it's sort of, um, I foresee that there will be sort of a, like a hybrid model where certain parts still run as native processes, but sort of all of the interesting thing, you know, where you do a lot of parsing and where stuff can simply go wrong, just runs in a cloud API process. Yeah, um, so that's a really good question. Yes or no? <laughs> um, so I'm really starting at the bottom, of course, and uh, you, you're starting with a C library and building up from there. So right now where I am is that C and C++ really work, um, as in libc++, a lot of the, the standard tests already passed from the test suite, and I'm now slowly getting to the point where I'm trying to get sort of more high-level libraries built on top of this that also include interpreters. So getting Lua to work on top of this, getting Python to work on this, that's really, I don't have anything concrete yet, but I'm now experimenting with building it against it and extending the C library to, you know, add non-standard functions that were actually needed by this core library. Yeah. So, so my, my um, idea would eventually be that, um, um, that Something like C Python, the official Python inter, uh, implementation, would just work on this, albeit slightly different. So the normal Python interpreter has standard include directories that it looks into. In this case, it would be the case that you, in your YAML file, explicitly give a list of directories, and that explicitly is passed onto the Python interpreter. So yes, you eventually should be at the idea that you can use the standard interpreters for Python or PHP, whatever you like, but um, Starting them up is a bit unconventional, but that's the best we can do in this case. <laughs>
Um, so uh, without a modified kernel is actually pretty hard because um, you, you could potentially do it, but then you wouldn't have the security benefits because the program could still, in assembly, call the original system call that did provide access to a, like a random path on disk. So the, the, the Linux security policy, for example, is really not powerful to emulate this. So um, that wouldn't be possible. But there, there's sort of an, another interesting point in your question. So what you could do is something the other way around. So a lot of the functions that depend on global namespaces, like open, that tries to open a global path name on disk, you could add a wrapper inside of the C library so that there is one file descriptor, like the root directory of the system, and something like open would just be translated to open a file underneath the root directory. Like a lib hack that you could use to more easily port existing applications. So working on this has sort of crossed my mind uh, on more than one occasion. And I almost started working on something like this, but my concern with that approach is that it basically brings you back to where you started. If all of the software that you're running on top of this stack is all based on this lib hack and all still assumes a global root directory and just calls into a special RPC to always just get an RPC or a, a, like a TCP socket to a random destination on the internet. You're then in the end not any better than where you started. You still end up with untestable, unsandbox software. That's still true, yeah. So there, there are still some advantages to it if you would have a lib hack like that. So my, my goal would be that eventually would be just a separate sort of maybe an overlay so that if you would, for example, install this lib hack and you would add a special include path to your compiler, that if you include standard io.h, you sort of get a, a, a standard io that stacks on top of the one of cloudlibc. So in cloudlibc, it only provides the features that don't provide any global namespaces, but then everything that depends on the global namespace is listed in this small, tiny standard I.O. that just adds a couple of missing features to it. And then it would be really clear, then programmers can really clearly decide, I want to have sort of the, 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 the pure capability-based runtime environment, or I just quickly want to get the software running um, in a sort of a quick and dirty way. Uh, that's sort of the, the model that, that I foresee, but I haven't started on that yet. I'm for, sort of first trying to see how far we can go by only using this purely capability-based environment. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, uh, then thank you all for your attention, and uh, also I liked the questions. They were really good and in-depth. <laughs>